Hello, welcome everybody. This is Angel Simpello from SRNA. Welcome to the Transverse Myelitis session. Um, and thank you so much for joining us at our symposium this weekend. Um, this is a disorder specific session with a talk on TM with Dr. Carlos Pardo from Johns Hopkins Medicine, including diagnostic criteria, acute treatments and long-term effects. Please type any questions in the Q&A section. We will have time to answer questions at the end of the session. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Carlos Pardo. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody around uh, different states and countries that are joining this RNA meeting. Thank you very much for joining the meeting. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, one topic that uh, uh, has been the focus of uh, um, our activities in the past uh, 25 years or more, uh, is the topic of myelitis. As you can see from my title, I try to avoid the use of the term transverse, and I will focus mostly in the terminology myelitis. And my conversation today with you uh, is going to be a little bit more on the philosophical side of defining what is myelitis, uh, particularly because there has been a lot of progress uh, understanding the topic of myelitis in the past several years. Uh, so what we are going to be discussing is what is myelitis, what is not. And again, um, most of the presentation that I'm going to uh, show you is based on our work at the John Hopkins Myelitis and Myelopathy Center that was the first uh, center that was established in the world for investigating uh, uh, what was called in the 90s and early 2000s, trash myelitis. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that most of the work that we have done in the past 20 years or more is the work of many people. Some of them are, uh, uh, are uh, described here and the pictures are here, but this is a work of many colleagues, many fellows, many residents, uh, many uh, physical therapists, occupational therapy, rehabilitation doctors and colleagues have been participating in the John Hopkins Stratomy Myelitis Center and later in the John Hopkins and Myelitis and Myelopathy Center. And with the support of the former Trash and Myelitis Association and now the SRNA, we have been able to collect this uh, extensive data. Uh, the major objective of this is, again, just try to understand the concept of myelitis versus myelopathy, and particularly to review the evolution of the concepts in the past several years. And my main goal today is to convince you to abandon the diagnosis of transient myelitis as diagnosis and adopt an etiological diagnosis, or better, a diagnosis that reflects the cause of the inflammation in the spinal cord called myelitis. Let me start with the beginning. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, when uh, Sandy Siegel and many of the people that have been working in the Transient Myelitis Association and many of us who work on the medical side of uh, Transient Myelitis, uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s, we actually uh, put the term Transient Myelitis uh, uh, frequently in the basket of multiple sclerosis. There were other diagnoses like uh, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis or the VIX disease that was at that time uh, the rare disease that presented with the spinal cord uh, inflammation as well as uh, optic neuritis uh, and rheumatological disorders. That was basically the spectrum of what was uh, known at that time as a transmyelitis. But the reality is that in the early 2000s, and, uh, there were many advantage, advan advances in understanding the problem. And probably the first advance understanding uh, the topic of um, myelitis was the discovery by our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic that one of those forms of the myelitis that was called the VIX disease was associated with presence of this antibody that is called aquaporin-4 antibody is the neuromyelitis uh, optic antibody that was basically the uh, reason many patients actually were experiencing problems in the spinal cord or in the optic nerve. And what was known after that discovery is that many of those patients with the VIX disease, neuromyelitis optica, actually uh, 
had a spectrum of clinical uh, 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 findings that were very different to the spectrum of multiple sclerosis. And basically it defined a, a new disorder uh, that is known as neuromyelitis optica now. Uh, later, more recently, there has been more uh, rediscovery, particularly with the finding that uh, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein as an antibody is a pathogenic uh, antibody that is associated with disorders that are mimicking uh, uh, myelitis, are uh, producing myelitis and producing a, a more uh, a, a wider spectrum of uh, brain lesions and optic nerve involvement. So this, once again, Point, uh, point us uh, to uh, the spectrum of the myelitis in the 20th century because we are learning more about the etiology causes of myelitis and the pathogenesis of myelitis. So what is the spectrum of myelitis in the, 20, uh, uh, in the year 2021? Uh, on one side, we have advanced clearly in understanding the cause of inflammation called myelitis in many ways. Uh, in the past several uh, uh, years, particularly uh, since uh, 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 2010 and 2012, we are learning more about the role of infections like enteroviral infections producing acute flux in myelitis in children. So this is actually a very important development in understanding some form of um, uh, myelitis and myelopathies in children. And we also understand uh, better the role of some infections and particularly post-infectious disorders in the presence of this inflammatory uh, form of myelitis or myelopathies. However, the major advance, as I mentioned before, is the understanding of autoimmune-associated myelopathies and uh, myelitis optica produced by anti-aquaporin-4 and myelin oligodendrocyte spectrum disorder produced by that antibody uh, known as a mock antibody. But we also understand better the role of other autoimmune disorders, autoimmune dis uh, myelopathies associated with rheumatological disorders. So at this moment, almost 20 years after that we started using the terminology uh, in our center of transient myelitis, we have a better uh, 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 understanding of what is the spectrum of this disorder that produces inflammation. We still have multiple sclerosis and we still have the term idiopathic transient myelitis in our terminology, but actually in many ways, we are uh, uh, decreasing the uh, impetus in uh, uh, designing the diagnosis of transient myelitis as the main diagnosis in the majority of patients that present with inflammatory disorders of the spinal cord. And particularly because there are more disorders that have been discovered or rediscovered or uh, disclosed to be associated with this spectrum of inflammation in the spinal cord. One of them is sarcoidosis that is clearly producing a chronic inflammatory disorder in the spinal cord. And all of these disorders are basically in the spectrum of this terminology that we call now myelitis. As you can see here, I am staying away of using the term transfer in this terminology because many of these terms of uh, uh, many of these disorders uh, that are including in this uh, term myelitis basically represent a very diverse spectrum of etiologies that we need to be aware as patients and we need to be aware as clinicians. Uh, let me point out one thing that is a little bit worrisome and is that in the past several years, we have included many inf no inflammatory myelopathies in the spectrum of transient myelitis or myelitis. And one of those are vascular myelopathies produced by acute strokes or vascular myelopathies produced, produced chronically by problems in the spinal cord like venous hypertension. And this is actually very concerning because unfortunately, some of these patients are treated as myelitis and are erroneously mistreated with medication that sometimes may produce more harm than benefit when the etiology of this spinal cord problem is a vascular etiology. And in the same uh, 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 spectrum of no inflammatory myelopathies, there are other disorders like metabolic disturbances uh, occasionally associated with the vitamin uh, 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 
uh, deficiencies or other type of metabolic disturbances that may produce problems that mimic transamylitis or myelitis, uh, may, uh, and also a structural myelopathy like spondylotic myelopathies that are very frequent uh, in our uh, uh, spectrum of myelopathies that occasionally are confused with myelitis and I er are erroneously treated as myelitis. So we need to be aware about that because unfortunately the term transamylitis that was coined for the first time in the mid uh, uh, 40s and, and late 40s after the discovery uh, or description of a patient that had uh, uh, infectious disorder and developed later an spinal cord disease and was called transamylitis. We have been uh, basically, we, we have been using this terminology uh, 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 extensively, but uh, unfortunately with uh, some erroneous connotation and uh, unfortunately producing misdiagnosis that may lead to mismanagement and mistreatment. So should we continue using the diagnosis of transamylitis in our clinical practice? Should we continue uh, uh, the use of this diagnosis, transamylitis, and telling our patient, you have transamylitis? Um, I will attempt to answer that question in the next few minutes, and I will try to convince that we should stay away of this terminology. Um, the rationale and support for that argument is, is a study that uh, we did actually in the past few years, where we went back to all our patients that had been referred to the John Hopkins Myelitis Myelopathy Center between 2010 and 2018 with the diagnosis of transfer myelitis. So the major focus of our study was to focus in the precision of that diagnosis and how the diagnosis in terms of the spectrum of causes of, of myelitis fit to uh, define specific treatments. And what we were very surprised is that uh, approximately a third of the patients with the diagnosis of transamylitis, actually they didn't have any form of myelitis or any form of inflammation of the spinal cord. And a third of the patients that were diagnosed with uh, transamylitis actually uh, had other problems like spinal cord infarctions of, uh, uh, or structural abnormalities uh, of the spine leading to spinal cord damage or injury or metabolic disturbances of, uh, 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 of the spinal cord rather than uh, uh, myelitis. It's very clear that yes, there was uh, evidence of myelitis in almost 70% uh, uh, of the patients, but it's very clear that the causes of those myelitis were, uh, uh, were very diverse. On one side, we had obviously the myelinating inflammatory myelopathies as uh, an important cause of myelitis. We had uh, uh, neuromyelitis spectrum disorder. We have neurosarcoidosis. We have infectious disorder, uh, basically producing and mimicking uh, inflammation of the spinal cord. And we have other rheumatological disorders. So this is extremely important because that uh, reflects that myelitis is a very heterogeneous group of disorders that need to be uh, treated specifically as the cause of the problem is. In other words, it's extremely important to clarify if the myelitis that a patient is experiencing is associated with a demyelinating disorder, is associated with neuromyelitis optica, is associated with mock spectrum disorder, or is associated with sarcoidosis, or is associated with a rheumatological disorder. So this is extremely critical and very important for the future, particularly because we are encountering more and more cases of myelitis. And importantly, we are having a better understanding of the problem and we have now better medications that are able to treat the problem and are able to uh, have better outcomes because we have a better treatment. So the bottom line here is myelitis as a disorder is a heterogeneous group of spinal cord diseases produced by different causes etiologies. And it's extremely important to understand that if we take a look of our retrospective experience, we have misdiagnosed almost 30% of the cases as TM when they don't have any clear cause of myelitis, except that they have other etiologies like vascular myelopathy. So it's extremely important to Keep in mind that because when we are 
uh, listening our patients as a physician. So where patients are telling us about the problems that they are experiencing, we need to keep in mind that we need to recognize clearly what are the major uh, clinical presentation of those myelopathies for understanding and establishing a better diagnosis. So as a clinician, the first step for evaluation of patients with suspected myelopathies are recognizing the symptoms of the myelopathy. And for the patient, the most important aspect for telling their clinicians what is going on is to identify the uh, symptoms that are associated with that spinal cord disorder, mostly weakness, sensory abnormalities like numbness, tingling, uh, problems with bladder dysfunction, like increasing urinary frequency or gait disturbances that produce lack of balance or unsteadiness. And it's extremely important that the clinician and the patients identify the temporal profile of evolution of those symptoms. It's extremely important that the, the patient discuss with the clinician what is the temporal profile, meaning the onset of symptoms and the uh, plateauing of the symptoms and the evolution of those symptoms in terms of, uh, 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 of, of such a temporal profile. This is extremely important for uh, the uh, clinician and for the patients, particularly for understanding the cause of the problem. So when we are dealing with spinal cord disorders and we are trying to identify myelitis and the cause of myelitis, that equation that actually involves several factors is not only the MRI, it's not only just one term of a, a symptom, it's basically an analysis that needs to identify what is going on with the patient what is going on with the temporal profile of the lesions, what is the uh, result of the uh, neurological examination to identify the theological factor. So this is a, 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 an equation that involves several factors, the time profile, the age of the patient, the localization of the problem in the spinal cord. And with that approach, we are able to achieve a better diagnosis and more precise diagnosis. So we, as clinicians need to pay attention to all of those elements, temporal profile, localization, evaluation uh, uh, by clinical exam, evaluation by MRI, and put together that information along with the spinal fluid analysis, blood testing, and other elements that will allow us to establish a better diagnosis and a better precision of the diagnosis. So spinal cord disorders are very well evaluated, not only clinically, but also with the spinal cord MRI. And the spinal cord MRI requires a very careful assessment of the pattern of involvement, not only uh, in the spinal cord to determine what is the involvement of the gray matter versus white matter, what is the extension of the lesion, what is the patterns of inflammation that may be reflected by enhancement, or what is the evidence that if there is any abnormality in the brain MRI or there is not. So all of those elements are actually going to help uh, uh, importantly in the uh, uh, more precise diagnosis of myelitis. Uh, the same with the spinal fluid analysis. The spinal fluid analysis is extremely critical for establishing a better diagnosis in myelitis. Identifying the presence or absence of oligoclonal bands, doing studies for viruses or immunological assays that may help to identify a uh, uh, specific disorder like a mock associated disorders or neuromyelitis optica, evaluating other uh, uh, elements uh, in the spinal fluid in the future will help to understand the potential outcome of the injury on the spinal cord. Now, let me give you a view of what we have been done, uh, what we are doing for understanding uh, a, a diagnosis and improving precision. And this is a study that was published by our group back in 2018 in the journal Neurology that represent an analysis of more than 400 patients with the diagnosis of transient myelitis that later we were able to dissect and clarify if there were really myelitis or vascular abnormalities related with the stroke or chronic vascular abnormalities related with dural AV fistulas. And what we basically introduced as an analytical approach was the factors, the different factors that influence 
the precision in the diagnosis of myelitis versus stroke or myelitis versus chronic uh, vascular problems of the spinal cord. And what we found, for example, is that uh, uh, in the case of differentiating myelitis versus strokes, the presence of autoimmune disorder was mostly in favor of myelitis and the presence of a temporal profile that was hyperacute was actually in favor of the diagnosis of a vascular uh, uh, abnormalities of the spinal cord. So when we had patients that had uh, neurological symptoms that evolved in a matter of minutes to few hours, uh, and we call this hyperacute, that actually was a factor that influenced more uh, uh, to our diagnosis of a vascular uh, ischemic uh, damage of the spinal cord or stroke rather than myelitis. And the presence of a more uh, 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 subacute and chronic uh, uh, evolving symptoms was mostly in favor of uh, the myelitis. It's very interesting that in the uh, uh, clinical profile of patients with a stroke, the acute onset of excruciated back pain either in the upper back or lower back actually was a factor that uh, uh, was uh, uh, an important factor to identify uh, patients with acute onset of uh, a stroke or vascular myelopathies. In the spectrum of chronic uh, vascular uh, 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 myelopathies, actually the chronicity uh, as well as the involvement of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, dysfunction, like a bladder dysfunction or bowel dysfunction, and particularly the worsening with exercise uh, uh, were factors that tilted uh, to our diagnosis of a vascular damage rather than myelitis. Age is an important factor and it's extremely important because, for example, the majority of the malignating disorders present in the spectrum of age, that is in mid age, uh, frequently between 20s and, uh, and 40s. And this is interesting because uh, neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorders may have the same distribution, but also there is a peak of presentation uh, to our uh, uh, age that is uh, a little bit older, uh, uh, 60s. And spinal cord strokes and vascular abnormalities have a potential bimodal presentation, including patients that are very young and patients that are uh, adults over age 60. So this is important to keep in mind because strokes and uh, acute or, or chronic vascular abnormalities may present in a different spec spectrum of age. Uh, spondylotic myelopathies that are those that are associated with uh, spine uh, uh, deformation, this kind of disease is frequently a, a disorder that is in after age 50. So that is important to keep in mind. So we have um, uh, 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 identified that the spectrum of uh, temporal profile and the spectrum of age is important for identifying different categories in diagnosis of hyperacute symptoms, identifying acute vascular myelopathies and acute vaccinomyelitis in children. Uh, acute symptoms uh, are frequently associated with uh, myelitis or inflammation associated with myelitis in different spectrum. Uh, uh, relapsing remitting symptoms are frequently associated with malignating disease or neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorders. And inflammation of the spinal cord associated with sarcoidosis is frequently a chronic evolving uh, 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 process. So this is important because uh, we can use all of those elements to improve the precision in the diagnosis of those myelopathies. Now, in terms of uh, 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 using MRI and using uh, diagnostic tools to improve the diagnosis of myelitis versus stroke, it's very clear that the MRI, particularly when the MRI has evidence of gadolinium uh, uh, enhancement, or when the MRI show lesions that are particularly localized in the posterior region of the spinal cord, those are elements that help in the diagnosis of myelitis. In contrast, uh, vascular strokes are frequently longitudinal extensive, but they don't have enhancement and they tend to have a more gray matter involvement rather than white matter involvement. And importantly, spinal fluid is a very good element and a very good factor to uh, classify diagnosis because spinal fluid analysis frequently show with evidence of increase of white blood cells, increase of oligoclonal bands or presence of oligoclonal bands. And this is actually a very important 
determinant for establishing a very precise diagnosis of myelitis versus vascular etiologies. Now, let's go back to one of the concerning aspects of the initial finding that I described to you, and is that a very important percentage of our patients, almost 32% of our patients, had other etiologies that were not myelitis, like spinal cord infarctions or vascular abnormalities. And this is important because if we take a look of uh, the figure that I showed you before, it appears that approximately at 30% of patients actually represent all of these etiologies, vascular etiologies, metabolic myelopathies, and myelopathies, structural myelopathies. So it's important to keep in mind that because the clinician needs to be aware about those etiologies before committing to a diagnosis of myelitis. And the reason is uh, vascular etiologies may have a different way to be treated. And unfortunately, the major problem that we have is that vascular myelopathies don't have a gold standard for diagnosis. We attempted to define arbitrarily uh, vascular myelopathy to those in which we have excluded other uh, etiologies like inflammatory or autoimmune etiologies in which the lesion was following a vascular distribution and there was a good uh, uh, evidence by uh, risk factors known for the stroke, like uh, uh, presence of uh, hypercoag hypercoagulable disorders or presence of other factors leading to stroke to be able to establish that diagnosis. But the reality is that we are still struggling to establish uh, a very good uh, and precise diagnosis of vascular myelopathy because we don't have uh, a good criteria to define those uh, by uh, clinical or by neuroimaging or spinal fluid uh, 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 studies. Now, why it's important to keep in mind the differential diagnosis? It is important to define what is an inflammatory myelopathy versus an ischemic myelopathy, because if we are dealing with the inflammatory myelopathies, we have the opportunity to treat those specifically with treatments like IV steroid treatment, plasma exchange, and, and in that way, we are able to uh, protect the spinal cord from inflammation. The problem is that if we erroneously misdiagnose patients with ischemic myelopathies and treat patients with plasma exchange or other immunosuppressive treatment, we are not helping those patients. We are actually exposing those patients to a higher risk of harming and producing other complications like opportunistic infections or more damage to the ischemic uh, 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 injury that they have uh, uh, experienced already. So it's extremely important to keep in mind of this because if we have a patient that uh, has an ischemic myelopathy, we need to identify the risk factor that led to the ischemic myelopathy to protect those patients in the future from other damage of the spinal cord or injury associated with ischemia. But if we have identified the patient with an uh, inflammatory myelopathy or myelitis, Clearly, obviously, the options for treatment are very clear. We have the opportunity to use B-cell depletion therapies. We have the opportunity to use complement inhibition therapies that are basically the most important development in the past uh, few years in the treatment of inflammatory autoimmune myelopathies. Uh, we have the opportunity to treat with other uh, uh, therapies like TNF-alpha inhibitors in the case of sarcoidosis associated myelitis, or we have the opportunity to use cytotoxic or immunosuppressive regimens to minimize the inflammatory damage of the spinal cord. So it's important then that when we diagnose myelitis, we attempt to clarify that the myelitis is associated with the imaninating disease, is associated with NMO spectrum disorder or mock related disease, because then we will have the opportunity to use all of these therapies and we, we may have uh, the opportunity to help patients in a better way and accomplish uh, uh, better outcomes and be able to recover most of the neurological function that patients have uh, lost uh, during uh, 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 the inflammatory injury. Now, if we are talking about myelopathies and we are talking about inflammatory myelopathies, in addition to those pharmacological uh, approaches to treat 
uh, uh, the myelopathy, we have also to keep in mind that the most important way for recovery is to use strategies with physical therapy, rehabilitation, occupational therapy. And after that, actually, we need to keep using physical therapy and occupational therapy and rehabilitation. And after that, guess what? We need to be using the same. And after that, we need to be using the same. So don't forget that it's not only what you are using in terms of medications like B-cell therapies, uh, like rituximab, like ocrelusomab, or the new medication that have been introduced in recent years, or the use of complement inhibition therapy for NMO, or the use of uh, TNF alpha inhibitors. We need to keep in mind that it's extremely important to associate those uh, medication or the use of those drugs to uh, medications and extra strategies with physical therapy, rehabilitation, and the most important, resilience, and the most important, a very good vitamin P. And you are going to be asking me, what is vitamin P? I will answer that in the question and answer session. But i like to uh, leave a message here is, please stop using the diagnosis of transient myelitis. Let's start identifying the cause of the myelopathy before we establish a, 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 a better treatment for uh, patients that are affected by myelopathies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Pardo, for that very helpful and valuable information. Um, we are just about at our end time right now, but um, if if we could take a moment to answer a question, please. Uh, Julie asked, I was diagnosed in 2008. They did not do any anti-MOG testing. Um, she's not sure why they would test for that. And she asked, should I have an anti-MOG test? Um, she, she adds, that if she had a vascular my myelopathy or stroke in the spinal cord, is the treatment different? So Julie, the, the answer is back in, 20, in, in 2008, there was no an antibody testing uh, for MOG. Uh, the MOG antibody actually has been uh, uh, developed and improved in the past uh, few years. And, and the validation of that process actually took several years. And uh, so if you think that you may need to reassess the diagnosis in 2008, the most important aspect is share with your neurologist the uh, clinical records and reevaluate the clinical profile of presentation of your problem. I already gave you some clues. If you think that your symptoms evolve dramatically between a few minutes uh, and a couple of hours or three hours, that is a concern for a vascular ischemic lesion of the spinal cord or stroke versus myelitis. If you think that your uh, symptoms evolve over uh, a few days and few weeks, it's very possible that you have uh, 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 inflammatory myelopathy, uh, myelitis, and it's important to reassess if there is evidence of uh, uh, antibody, either aquaporin-4 or MOC or any other rheumatological disorder marker. Uh, to determine if uh, you are in the right treatment right now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, perhaps we could move forward a, a little more. Um, another question from T. Scott. For idiopathic TM, if my MRIs have shown no active inflammation in the past seven years, diagnosed nine years ago, are there any medical treatments I should consider to improve my symptoms? Uh, very good question. So many patients like you actually uh, uh, have that profile that present what we call monophasic myelopathy or monophasic myelitis. Uh, if originally at the beginning of your problems there was no identification of etiological factors, the answer is yes, you may have an uh, idiopathic uh, form of myelitis. Some of those idiopathic form of myelitis were formed that possibly were related with a post-infection disorder, were related with an infection, or were related with some transitory uh, 
dysregulation of the immune system that produce the myelitis. And that is, unfortunately, we call idiopathic because uh, in the medical term, we were not able to identify a clear cause of the problem. If you have remained stable and the uh, myelitis hasn't uh, experienced a, 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 an exacerbation or recurrence of, of the disease, that means that you are going to be relatively fine in the next, uh, in the rest of your life. What is probably important for improving your symptoms is that you have an evaluation by a rehabilitation specialist to direct you in the identification of the deficit and direct you in strategies with physical therapy, occupational therapy, to improve some of those problems that you may have or you may, you may be experiencing right now. And I, I always think that the best allied of patients with myelitis and myelopathies is not only the neurologist, is the best allied person and provider is your rehabilitation doctor, your physical therapist, occupational therapist that should be helping you to keep a good physical stamina, uh, to keep a very good physical conditioning. Remember that by doing a physical therapy session for uh, six weeks, that is not going to be sustainable if you don't continue doing that. That's the reason I emphasized in my previous slides that you need to keep doing PT. And after that, you need to keep doing PT. And following that, you need to continue doing PT. Thank you so much. Um, perhaps we could answer two more questions quickly. Thank you. Uh, from Tony, time profile of appearance of a symptom seems to be a key part of diagnosis. What are the symptoms that should be considered when evaluating the time profile? So time profile uh, is very helpful, particularly uh, 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 to identify what type of symptoms presented at the beginning, what was the time uh, to nadir or plateauing of the symptoms. Because if you have what we call hyperacute symptoms, meaning from uh, minutes to a couple of hours or three hours, that is going to be very helpful for the clinician to investigate the possibility that this is a, a, a problem that is a, a vascular a, a, a cause of the spinal cord disorder and non necessarily myelitis. The, the period of few days uh, uh, is basically the period of uh, uh, a few days to uh, uh, a week is mostly uh, those autoimmune disorders in the spectrum of NMO, in the spectrum of MOG, that actually are very helpful. And you have uh, a clinical profile that extends more than uh, 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 several days in, in weeks, and basically is somewhat evolving. That actually is something helpful to say, okay, this may be a demyelinating disease in the spectrum of multiple sclerosis, or maybe another type of chronic evolving or subacute or chronic evolving uh, 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 inflammatory myelopathy, or even is non necessarily a myelitis, uh, and maybe uh, another type of uh, problem like those that happen in vitamin deficiencies, for example. So uh, uh, dissecting that temporal profile is one of the elements of, of a better and precise diagnosis. It's not going to be the only one, but it's going to be very helpful for the clinician for helping uh, the patient to identify the cause of the problem. Thank you. And finally from Janelle, are there more testing options for individuals who are diagnosed as TM, but test negative for MOG and MO? and other diagnoses? Uh, Janelle, it's extremely important that uh, once you are diagnosed with myelitis or myelopathy, and at the beginning, there is no clear definition of the cause, you keep basically checking with your neurologist. I uh, frequently advise my patients in which we are not able to identify at the beginning of the uh, uh, spinal cord disorder, the cause of the problem, I actually, I encourage my patients to return to my clinic in which we are going to say, okay, we are going to test for MOG in three months and we are going to check for NMO in three months and we are going to check in six months later or even one year later. Or even sometimes we need to check for demyelinating diseases and occasionally uh, demyelinating diseases show up as a form of myelitis 
uh, that remains quiet for two, three years and then show up as a form of a demyelinating disease with brain lesions or optic neuritis. So there is always a need to keep alert uh, to the answer of new symptoms or to keep a very good conversation with your clinician to um, stay alert to the possibility that other uh, disorder may be unmasked later. Rheumatological disorders occasionally behave in that way. I mean, rheumatological disorders like lupus or, or Sjogren's disease, or even uh, uh, sarcoidosis or neurosarcoidosis. So you, uh, you need to establish this continuous follow-up just to be alert to uh, 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 the identification of other factors. If you have remained stable for more than five years and none of those other disorders that I mentioned are diagnosed, I think that you are safe. You can continue being alert, but not necessarily extremely anxious that you are going to have a, another attack or another problem. Thank you so much. I Unfortunately, I don't believe we have time for any further questions, but we will be publishing answers to the questions that have been posted at a later time. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Pardo, for joining us. We're very pleased that you could join us today. And um, we're very happy that everyone else could be here with us. We invite you to join us for the following talk that's coming up. It's live right now in the stage area, acute treatments at onset and relapse with uh, Dr. Eowyn Flanagan. I, this is a, we're going to be moving on now. And this is the end of this session. We hope to see you um, at the next session on the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.